I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. It's one small step for man, one giant leap. This is This week, we're talking about the railroad and the Wachusett Reservoir and how the railroad was impacted by the building of the Wachusett. So I kind of call it the railroad that went underwater. Had they not rerouted it, the railroad would have run underwater. <laughs> okay. So the railroad was called the Massachusetts Central to start with. That was sort of its pre-bankruptcy name. It struggled for many years. It was a railroad that many authors say should never have been built. It was kind of a nowhere to nowhere railroad. They missed all the opportunities, frankly, for connecting to businesses. The Fitchburg Railroad did a much better job of connecting to major towns. Here, the Central Mass, Mass Central, as it started, really just went out to Hudson, some factories there, Clinton, some factories there, went all the way out to Northampton with a lot of little stops along the way. So not a big revenue generator. So this is a map of the railroad. Um, you can see we have Boston on the right and many, many little stops going through the countryside. Um, North-south, there's a junction at South Sudbury, which is kind of the first large black line that joined up with Concord. And that's, on, that's a rail trail that's being built right now, quite surprisingly. Um, the next ju uh, junction uh, was really here in Clinton. Uh, there were junctions up to uh, Portland, Maine, eventually. A railroad called the Worcester, Nashua, and Portland. And that went uh, up to Nashua, obviously, and went on to Portland. And the rail trail that's very popular in air uh, has signs that will show P113, meaning Portland is 113 miles away. And if you turn around, it'll say W34. Worcester is 34 miles away. And so it finally went out to Northampton, and that was the expected terminus, and they made it eventually after many, many years. So in our area, just to kind of focus, um, I was gonna start our trip, if you will, on the railroad in Hudson, and that had two stations. We talked about that in uh, one of our first presentations. Hudson had a station on uh, Felton Street, which is like a dentist's office today, if I'm not mistaken. And there's also, there was a large station that's long gone on Main Street in Hudson, where the old Catholic high school was. Now it's a thing called something like My Bank. Um, the uh, Bar Lunch was a famous lunch stop that's now Hudson Appliance. And uh, on the corner is a Shell station, and there's a Subway a sandwich shop. So there's really nothing left of that original large station uh, at this point. So Hudson had the two of them. Again, um, the one down on Main Street that's long gone went to Marlboro. So the, Mar the very popular rail trail that you have today um, goes right past where that station would have been. It curves by the big factory on 43 Broad Street uh, and starts a pretty steep uphill ascent. Uh, some nice, uh, nice scenery, some rock cuts, uh, and w winds its way past the uh, Assabet uh, High School and eventually goes into the sort of the high side of Marlboro to really no spectacular ending. It just, <laughs> there's, I wish there was an old station there, but there isn't, okay? At Felton Street, you have again this dentist office, and again, there's remnants through the north side of Hudson of tracks that are still there, but boy, they're, they're buried deep and the, oh, they've all been paved over on the streets. So the Marlboro Branch, the one that ran again uh, below Main Street, um, service there ended in 1960. And as far as the Central Mass goes, the freight service ended in 1980. So that was the last of the trains that ran through, through Hudson. And there's a picture of the station on, again, Felton Street, the north side of Hudson. St. Michael's Church in the background, the two spires. Horse and buggy waiting uh, patiently sort of under the, uh, the cover. 
So beyond that, you would have left and passed through a little thing called South Bolton, long gone. The station was turned into someone's home during World War II. I think it's something like 468 South Bolton Street at this point. Uh, so the station did not go to waste. <laughs> the uh, remnants, though, are long gone. They're all just weeds and trees at this point. And so you would have gone under the interstate, so there's a passage under, under 495. And this would probably be a scene that would have been where the uh, current big Highland shopping center is up on the hillside. And you can see one old diesel, a uh, caboose, probably required by regulations, and a boxcar full of lumber, possibly for Colwell's uh, lumber yard down here. But that was really the very end. And again, this is 1974. Uh, I think the uh, comments in the books that I have say this probably would have been the last photograph of a train coming into Berlin. So um, this was the little Berlin station. We have Mary Porter's house in the background, still there. And uh, the tracks are all in the, uh, in the weeds, so to speak. There's lots of tracks. There's was bypass tracks for trains to pull off and then have an express train come through. Um, cute little station, sadly long gone. And here's a winter scene where there were no snow blowers. Everybody had to shovel the snow by hand. And it's amazing how open it is, isn't it? That the, uh, going all the way down, down the tracks. Again, a little bit of a repeat from, from the previous uh, presentation. Underneath, the, at the four corners, we still have an active railroad track, all right? And a long time ago, there was a little station called Carter's, long gone at this point. I think the liquor store is probably off to the right, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this was the New Haven Railroad. It had other names could they called the Old Colony. Another old name was the Agricultural Branch. Um, but that's still active. The tracks seem to be in awful shape. They're all curvy and look like they could really use some, some service. But the trains come through from Northborough. And the Central Mass, the railroad that we're talking about today, ran across Carter's on the bridge that, again, is taken down about 1960 but we do see the old stone pylons from, boy, about 1872, something like that. So they've been there for a long, long time. So we talk about the Wachusett Reservoir and, and the, you know, the founding of why it was necessary. So I I've, I've found a couple of books that are interesting. I'll point, point them out in a moment. Jamaica Pond apparently was the first real reservoir that Boston identified uh, apart from just wells and cisterns back in the colonial days. And I think we, we can't imagine what Boston looked like for all the fill <laughs> that has gone in. Um, it was really just kind of a little knob, and of course now you know, everything's been filled in, so it, you can't even imagine what, uh, what Boston was like. So Little Jamaica um, Reservoir, the Jamaica Pond, was the, the first attempt at, um, at that, and that's down in the corner with a, uh, a little, red, little red dot in the, uh, the lower, lower left. Population started to grow, uh, immigration started to increase, and the Coquituate Reservoir, uh, in the, uh, basically in the center, so on the right side of the screen, we see a long lake, and indeed it was called something like Long Pond, and once they dammed it, it turned into Coquituate Lake, and that was the second major reservoir uh, for Boston, um, and again, lasted until 1951. Still wasn't enough, and they went out to Sudbury. So they dammed up the Sudbury River, and you have the Sudbury Reservoir, and that again is over on the left side, and we see the Mass Pike and Route 9 going east to west. And we all tend to see the reservoir if we're on the Mass Pike uh, by the Sheraton Terra. There's a little railroad bridge. Looks like it's kind of defunct, and then the lake is beyond that. If you're on Route 9, there's a giant apartment complex as you kind of enter the, the Framingham area and the, uh, the reservoir is on your, your left side. So now you can see the population, um, 50,000 in 1840, 200,000 30 years later. So immigration is really starting to impact Boston significantly. Technologically, septic systems and plumbing. So apparently plumbing appeared around 1840 for the wealthy. Became a little more common 1850 to 1860, all right, for maybe the middle class, if you will. Um, but it's still remarkable how little plumbing there was across the country. Uh, one statistic I saw said something like, in 1920, less than 1% of homes had both, I think, 
running water, plumbing, and electricity. So what a, what a thing we take for granted today to have electrical systems that can pump our water and then the piping and the sanitary conditions. Sorry? What did you say the date was again? 1920. 1% with both electricity and plumbing. It's incredible, isn't it, what we take for granted. So the need for water continued and continued. The Irish immigration wave, Italian immigration wave, more and more indoor plumbing. Um, they had to keep building reservoirs. So little reservoirs started to pop up. A uh, small one in Wabin, Chestnut Hill, and Brookline. So the demand was insatiable. And indeed, uh, even with the Sudbury and the Coquituate, it just wasn't enough. And they kept looking at the growth of population and, of course, not wanting to hit a wall. We're trying to do some long-range long -range planning. Lake Winnipesaukee was even considered <laughs> as a source. And how you'd get that water pumped down to Boston would be an effort. The Merrimack River was considered, but I believe the pollution level in the Merrimack was, was uh, too much to get over. And finally, they went out and looked at the Nashua in Clinton, and they could see you know, some of the natural formations that where the dam was uh, between the Clamshell Hill and, uh, and Burnett's Hill. Um, it would be a natural place for a dam. And then they had to consider the topography going out into uh, Boylston and so on. And apparently, it was a dual, you know, very doable idea. They also needed to have uh, gravity do the work for them. And it turned out that that worked out very, very well, that the systems were effectively gravity fed. And the dam itself is known as a gravity dam. Uh, it was basically just a flat front dam with a lot of stone, stone uh, blocks, as opposed to the curve type of dam that you see like on the Hoover Dam out, uh, out west. So indeed, that was the plan. Um, you can see quiet surveys in uh, 1893. So the planning started back around 1880s. Um, rumors started to persist in the area about a lot of surveying going on, wondering what was, what was happening. Tunnels were considered, both for the railroad and for the aqueducts that were going to be built. And the idea was to connect it to the existing reservoirs uh, through the different aqueduct systems that they planned. And it's hard to imagine, isn't it? The, drilling these giant tunnels that you can probably drive a railroad car through uh, to transport the water. And again, think about technology. Um, you know, there's no trucks at this point, a lot of horse and wagons, but you did have steam power. So you did have things like steam power drills and, and you know, different mechanisms, uh, ste so-called steam shovel that they used to have. Uh, at least that technology was available to make an, uh, an, an undertaking like this uh, viable. They created different water boards, Metropolitan Water Districts, <laughs> but the Metropolitan Water Board, uh, MDC, and you get MWRA today, there's another abbreviation you hear about. So these different boards um, took different forms over the years as the scope of the water needs got larger and larger. So indeed, it got serious in 1895, and the actual building occurred between 1897 and about 1905, all right? The dam the dam was built and then the reservoir itself was completely filled in 1908. Um, I always like to cite some books that might be of interest to people. Um, this is a great book that takes the whole history of Boston's water needs, again, from the colonial period all the way to the Quabbin Reservoir. I won't get into too deeply to the Quabbin, pardon the pun. Um, it's a whole other subject that you can, can deal with, the, uh, the politics and so on of, of going out to, out to the center of the state. This is a great, great book. And um, this is a wonderful little book by a young man named Eamon Earls from Lancaster. He was, I think, 16 at the time. And he got fascinated by the whole history of the building of the Wachusett Reservoir. And he wrote a book. And uh, he gave a presentation at the Holder Memorial in Clinton to a packed audience. It was very well attended. I'm probably going back at least 10 years at this point, so I certainly want to acknowledge his, uh, his work. It's a very, very good undertaking. So to build the Wachusett Dam, um, we had a couple towns lose land. They didn't disappear like they did in the Quabbin. Four towns completely disappeared to build the Quabbin Reservoir. Here you had loss of land in Boylston, West Boylston, and Sterling. Um, and the biggest problem they had right off the bat was the railroad was going to run right through the middle of where the reservoir was going. So obviously, that had to be a priority in planning 
the different stages of the building of the, of the reservoir. It was, it was decided that they would, they would build a tunnel in what an area called the clam shell. So in Clinton, we have a high hillside that overlooks the Nam and a Wilson Street kind of runs the length and eventually goes down to the actual dam itself. Um, so that's the clamshell, and it was decided that they would build an 1,100-foot tunnel to get the railroad through, and they would build this rickety viaduct, as they call it, or trestle, that would run in front of the dam. Um, and that would be the answer to rerouting the railroad. Once that was completed, then you could seriously think about building the dam, clearing the land, and filling, filling in. They then had to figure out where the railroad would go once it got through the, the uh, tunnel and the viaduct. And it turned out they had to have some switch points. Some trains had to run down to Worcester. Some had to make a big curve up into Clinton itself. So that was a new way that they had to figure the, the routing of the railroad. Previously, it had just gone straight out to Northampton. Let's see if we can figure this out a little bit here. <laughs> this is the so-called before map. In the corner here, we have West Berlin Five Corners. And in the old days, it ran down under the hill and over to some stations that are long gone, Boylston, South Clinton, and so on. The other railroad went north. That's the old colony or New Haven. And so the new route had to eliminate that whole area going through the, the, uh, where the reservoir would be. And these are some of the old stations that were long gone. They were, they were going to be inundated by the reservoir. Many, many thousands of beautiful glass plate negatives were taken by the Metropolitan Water Board to document the complete building of the tunnel, the viaduct, and the dam itself. It's remarkable, and they've all been preserved, and they're all on the computer. 8,000 plus images, yep. clear as can be, just remarkable. So I call it Gone with the Wind. These are the scenes in the valley before the reservoir was built. I believe that's the famous old stone church that you see on Route 140 uh, as you go down to uh, 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 West Boylston and so on, on, uh, on the back road. 110 comes in, meets, uh, meets 12 and 140, and so that's that causeway that's between the water, and that, I believe, would be the church that we see today. It was one of the few buildings that was preserved there's where the railroad ran, and I, if I'm not mistaken, that too should be the causeway that turned into the road that we know today. And you can see the river that would eventually come to fill the reservoir. And it would all go underwater, just as happened in the Quabbin. Yep. So this was the reroute plan. The old dotted line there was where the railroad did run. The reservoir eventually filled in. And the railroad took a hard turn in West Berlin, went up and curved across the t uh, clamshell in a tunnel, went by Clinton High School today behind it, and then eventually went right through the middle of what would become Clinton High School on a switch to go up into Clinton to join the railroad coming from Worcester. A little more of a sort of a topographical map, um, again, showing where the railroad would have been right through the middle of the water. It, it apparently was because the railroad never had enough money yeah, to operate. <laughs> it was terrible, yeah. They struggled and struggled. So indeed, it was all undertaken by, uh, by the state and the Metropolitan Water Board. Thank you. So you bet. So afterwards, again, we see the track running up to the north, curving, going by the Clinton High School at the top of the reservoir, and eventually made its way down along Route 110 uh, down to uh, Boylston, where there was some large junctions. There were uh, some significant junctions in the old days. Again, many of these lines are long gone to just through uh, disuse and bankruptcies. So again, the, the top priority was you got to do something about the railroad before you flood, flood the land. And so they started with this idea that they were going to have what they called the viaduct. I always sometimes hear about that in terms of water, but uh, in this case, it's, the, uh, it's a trestle is another word for it. And it was a high iron trestle. I think one of the um, John, you said it was the, the tallest at the time. So what you see there is the, um, the footings that are still visible in the river to this day. Um, so they installed those. They had to drill the tunnel 
Uh, they figured out where it was going to come out, and then on the opposite side um, was going to be the, um, the foundation for the, uh, for the viaduct on the other side. All, all very rocky, good, good, stable, good stable geological conditions. A lot of rock had to be cut. We see some early work on the dam on the far left side, but uh, very, very early. Again, remarkable number of uh, photographs being taken of every aspect of the, the construction. So they had to start with the different towers, uh, some on land and then going out into the middle of the water on those uh, footings. Again, this is taken, the Clinton High School would be just off to our right. They had to have cement mixing plants that they built on site. And you can see they even had little temporary railroads uh, with little tiny steam engines to shuttle around material, uh, blocks, cement, gravel, and so on. All, all disappeared, of course, at the end. And there were some pretty horrible living conditions, too. They hired a lot of immigrants, and there were really horrible slums uh, that people had to live in during the construction of the, uh, of the dam. It was, it was tough work. Again, the only machinery would have been things like, I say, steam shovels and probably some steam drills, but uh, no, no vehicles at that point. So the viaduct is coming along pretty nicely. Um, that would have been coming right out of the tunnel at that point. Okay, about halfway done. And we can see work being done on the dam in the distance with the other frames um, beyond, beyond the viaduct itself. That's Route 70 as we know it today, going right by the dam. And again, we saw that mixing plant a moment ago. Here we have the, uh, the west side of the tunnel being created. And that would be Wilson Street up on top of the hill. This is the east side on Clamshell Road, digging that out. And isn't that weird? <laughs> That's the inside of the tunnel. So, an early picture of the, uh, of the drilling going on. Let me see, the date of that is September of 1902. And eventually, of course, it would be increased, widened up, and uh, shored up uh, with um, uh, cement in some cases and, and wood. So there's the, some of the wood framing, if you will, as they began to go deeper and deeper. Man standing in the middle. And again, more framing. 19, still looks like 1903, if I'm not mistaken. And so now they're, they're rerouting Clamshell Road. One of the difficulties of looking at these old photographs is trying to figure out where you are, because many of them will say something like Station 117 or, you know, 124. And so you really would need an engineering map to know. When you look at it, of course, the land has been just completely cleared, you know, bare, and they've put in all kinds of... Uh, uh, steam shovels again, you know, cutting away at the, uh, at the rock and so on. Um, so it's tough to tell sometimes exactly, but again, this is the east side that will eventually go down to Berlin Five Corners. Now it's looking pretty good. It's all, it's lined. Again, the, en the entrance itself at the west was lined, and we do see a lot of graffiti today in there. Sadly, a lot of drug paraphernalia and things like that. There's been an attempt to kind of close it off now that they've announced a rail trail, but I heard that the fence may not be in good condition as people persist in trying to get into the tunnel. It becomes just natural rock cut as you go down the middle of it. And it's, again, it's about 1,100 feet long. This again is the clamshell, the clamshell road that's uh, going to head toward Berlin. And eventually, the, um, uh, the, it's actually the central mass railroad bed uh, that's going to make its way down along the, uh, the Berlin Road, like by Ruse Garage, for example. They had to figure out what to do with the water if, they, if the dam overflowed, so they have what they call a waste channel that's still there today. Deals with uh, significant overflows during heavy rains. Apparently it's been used a few times. And this is 1903, it says still. And now the dam is getting pretty serious, December 04, so we've got a whole year um, where a lot of progress has been made. And you can see the generating station roof down at the bottom. And we can see the water filling up over in the central left side. Certainly looks like it's nearly complete at that point. 1905, July. And that's the, 
that's the completed project. Um, so that would be taken on top of the dam. Um, a study, if you will, I guess, or a person who studied under Frederick Law Olmsted, the famous landscape, uh, landscape architect, uh, was assigned to do some of the beautification uh, of the tunnel. It's, it's quite, looks quite nice. Still looks very beautiful, all the years gone by. And there's a fountain there in the middle. Again, that the viaduct or trestle came down in 1975. So it went out of service, uh, I'd say 1958 was the last train from Berlin over to Clinton. And that was the end of the service. And then two years later, they took down the, uh, the old bridge over the uh, stream and the five corners in Berlin. So for 15 years, the viaduct sat there unused. They finally found somebody to, to take it down. I think he might have done it for the scrap value of the steel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And it was, there's an actual video that you can see on YouTube. It's about 10 seconds long of the trestle coming down uh, in the, into the river. It just kind of collapses. Quite a, quite a show. It's nice that somebody <laughs> at least thought to, to film something like that. So again, by 1908, the reservoir was filled to its, its design limits. Um, we see the power generating station in the middle with the red roof. And um, there's the railroad in the lower part. And again, what they call the waste channel, the overflow channel is coming down under the railroad and a nice little arched bridge there. They decided that they would take advantage of the dam by putting in generators, right? And so they built the generating house or power station as they called it. Um, but uh, I talked to a, a park employee over there and apparently the foundation of the power station was laid in, the big generating equipment was put in place and then they finished the building around it. And he said that essentially the machinery can never come out, it's too big. I guess the, it just wouldn't be worth the effort to ever take it out and find some way to replace it. I don't think the capacity is big enough to make it worth the expense. Um, but uh, yeah, they went in place and they worked until 1955 apparently. So essentially shafts under the dam turned at 90 degrees. They went through the penstock into the turbines. The water generated the uh, movement of the turbines, which then connected up to the generators up on top. And again, the, the power lines aren't there at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a good picture of that, but uh, that's how the, uh, the generation occurred. And the beauty was that the water that was gonna be sent to the Holtman Aqueduct in Boston essentially provided that flow, provided the generating power. So it was a nice dual use, if you will, of both the flow in the uh, aqueduct and the generation at the same time. So again, that's a, just a little, better close up of the, uh, the generating station. It's really an architectural beauty. It's, it's a gorgeous building. There's some pictures of the turbines and I, I realized it's a picture of some kind of an accident that occurred. It looks like the insides of the turbine exploded um, and we have this uh, detritus lay, laying on the floor. But otherwise there were supposedly four, four generators uh, in place. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer so I can't explain, explain the workings of them but uh, they're, still, they're still there, all intact. Okay. And indeed, it started in 1911, so it took a couple of years to get everything running. And apparently it was the first time that hydropower came from a public water supply source. Other than that, it was more like the, you know, the Hoover Dam is really just, you're banking the water uh, for the city, uh, um, whereas here it was specifically for a reservoir itself as opposed to recreation and so on. So as they say, the generators are kind of trapped. <laughs> they, they're never coming out, and you'd have to demolish the building if you ever needed to. So again, just an aerial, aerial view of the whole scene uh, taken in 1960. You see the extent of the reservoir. So we saw a lot of pictures of the drilling of the tunnel. So here's a train, a steam engine emerging from the finished product on the east side, what they call the clamshell, clamshell road goes there. This is. Uh, seems to be something of a tour of the viaduct for the public. People seem pretty well dressed there, uh, taking a view of the, uh, of the viaduct. 
I'd heard stories that foolish boys thought they could jump off the top into the water and apparently it was fatal. But apparently it was okay to go up to perhaps the first brace, uh, climb up the first brace of the viaduct and jump off into the water and not get hurt. But if you went much higher than that, you're going to lose your life. And apparently some boys did. And there's a gentleman standing at the tunnel entrance on the east side. Here's the west side, the one that many of us are familiar with, right above Route 70 today. The bridge is obviously gone and there's a big stone abutment, pretty well grown in at this point, but I'm sure that that's going to get cleared as we see some work on the rail trail that's been proposed. Look how clear it is going up the hill to, uh, to Wilson Street. Nice shot of a train coming across the viaduct. You can see the dam is still in progress at this one. This is December of 03. But just as a railroad shot, it's a, really, it's a really nice one. I met a gentleman one time who said as a kid, he was in Hudson, and they were taking the steam engine over to Clinton. And there was something holding up the trip in Hudson. And I guess as they waited, the, the boy at that time <laughs> walked up to the engineer. And the engineer said, hey, kid, do you want to ride in the cab? I guess mother said, OK, that's all right. So he got to climb up in the cab with the engineer. And so they made the trip from Hudson over to Clinton. And he got to ride in the cab. And he said, once they hit that viaduct, he said the creaking and the noise of that viaduct, he said, was as loud as the locomotive. He said the engineer said he couldn't wait to get across. <laughs> Notice again, would have been the, the last few days of operation of the old steam locomotives, which occurred in 1956. And again, I think we saw this uh, perhaps in our first lecture. After a while, it became expensive to run steam engines just for the limited passenger service Clinton was seeing. And so they used to run the, what they call a self-propelled car, uh, basically a gasoline engine car, um, an old passenger car basically turned into uh, a self-propelled car with a gas motor. And they, they were called doodle bugs. And so there it is, just about to go into the tunnel, having crossed the viaduct. And again, that's a pretty, pretty nice picture that I think is a bit dated. I'm sure that's about 15 years old. It's pretty well grown in. There's a lot of graffiti now uh, inside the tunnel. Um, but we'll see what the plans are to actually try to reuse it. As you crossed over the tunnel, just before you hit the Clinton High School, there was a big giant rock cut um, that they had to drill through. And once they were through that, you had the reservoir off to your left, and they built the track at the edge of the reservoir. And again, where Clinton High School is today, the switch could be turned off and go over to the uh, Clinton Depot in town to meet the other railroad. And these are just the switching points. The little orange square shows you where the Clinton High School is today. And the railroad ran along the, uh, the reservoir. It joined down by, uh, I think, what's called Sterling Road on Route 110. There's a little cemetery there. So just before the cemetery, there was a junction point. Right? And then uh, you don't see any evidence of anything of the old curve that went up into Clinton itself. And this is the Clinton Depot that you still see today on Main Street uh, and Water Street downtown. Seems like it's been boarded up for years, and there's nothing much to see in there from what I can tell. And again, some pictures we saw last time of the old turntable so the locomotive could turn around. We see one of those doodlebug self-propelled cars in the corner and a train leaving for probably Worcester or Boston. And again, the old typical engines back in those days. Clinton Junction was created to meet the reservoir reroute and the the trains coming from Clinton itself. And so again, that was a switching point to decide whether you were going uh, into Worcester or going into Clinton. After all the construction in the reservoir, there was a junction point go Oakdale, and you could see now all the little towns that the railroad continued to go through out to Northampton. The hurricane of 38 broke the railroad uh, around a little town called Wheelwright. And for the lack of $25,000, they decided to discontinue the rail service. So it became an abandoned western end out to Northampton, and it became limited basically to Clinton or, um, say, Rutland uh, on, the, uh, on the east end. And so they never bothered to repair the railroad. The damage was considered to be not, uh, not worth fixing. So obviously, after the Wachusett, that wasn't enough. And even at the time of the building of the Wachusett Reservoir, 
it was clear that they had this, what they called the Swift River and the Ware River in their sights as future sources of water. Um, and so the famous four towns out in the Swift River Valley, I think it's Greenwich, Prescott, um, Enfield, and Dana, those four towns disappeared legally. Um, I think 1938 was the final town meetings. Um, people, re buildings were relocated. Um, obviously, land was, was, you know, compensated probably poorly in those days. Um, there's, there's, you know, some, some buildings made it out. Other ones were just demolished completely. Uh, and the MWRA took over and built the big dam in Belchertown. And then that filled up the valley. And um, again, it's, uh, that filled up finally in 1947. It took a long time to fill. And it has a 412 billion capa uh, gallon capacity. Apparently, it's one of the world's largest reservoirs. So hopefully, that'll do Boston for a long, long time. I hope. Although certain years you see the water level really low, uh, some of the aerial photographs, it's kind of scary. Uh, you know, some of the drought years we seem to have. And so that's it. I, at some point, you know, we could go deeper into the Quabbin Reservoir um, and, you know, ex explore how that, how that all happened. But um, this just gives you a good idea of what the, what the needs were for Boston's water and that the Wachusett Reservoir was really a key solution uh, for that problem for many, many years and still is extremely important and viable. If you remember on 9-11, they sent the Army or National Guard out to guard the, uh, guard the dam. Uh, you can't afford to have an accident. Uh, in terrorism, I think there was fear, too, that somebody might blow the dam or put some poison in or something like that. So it's a very key part. There's all kinds of studies, too, you can do as the different aqueducts, what they call the Holtman Aqueduct and the Weston Tunnels. It's an amazing series of uh, uh, water conveyances, uh, both above ground and, and underground, uh, to reroute all this water to the different reservoirs that are getting closer and closer to Boston. It's just incredible. So it's an interesting subject. <laughs>